American operation was launched to save the western sectors of the city and their people. Light and power, mainstay of the city's survival, depend on raw coal flown in British aircraft to Berlin's three airports. In March 1948, Stalin imposed his blockade. Berlin, surrounded by East Germany, was itself divided into a Soviet sector and a trio of western sectors, each with its own airport, the only link with the outside world. At the height of the airlift, 50 flights landed at each airfield every hour, more flights than are currently allowed at Gatwick. Today, every 90 seconds throughout the day and night marks the arrival or departure of supplies vital to the survival of the capital under blockade. A bare 30 minutes is allowed each aircraft for unloading, checking and refueling. No airlift operation of the size of this had ever been attempted before. It was put together in the most phenomenally short time, so it was a tremendous exercise in what aviation can do for the community. I think it opened the eyes of the world to what air transport was going to be able to do to the world. Eleven months later, Stalin gave in, aware the West wouldn't let him take Berlin. The Allies' persistence had shaped the post-war map of Europe. Today, that persistence was marked, a Dakota landing at Tempelhof Airport, carrying ambassadors from all three countries involved and met by some of the people whose very existence the airlift had guaranteed. We're going back now to the report about then paid his own way to NASA, starting as a flight controller. He now earns £28,000 a year as a mission specialist who'll fly the shuttle in orbit. For Mike Fole, the childhood dream of becoming an astronaut came true. He reports for work each day at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, where he's now NASA's youngest fully qualified astronaut. Turned down by the RAF, he studied astrophysics at Cambridge and encouraged by his American grandmother, paid his own way to NASA's front door. I banged on the door, visited the visitor center that you've seen here, and, and uh, said, I want to be an astronaut. Onboard computer programs have been examined. NASA, impressed, gave him a job. By 1985, he was working in mission control as a flight controller. But as he saw each shuttle mission go up into the sky, he was more determined than ever to become an astronaut. He now lives minutes from the space center with his wife, Rhonda, who also works at NASA and also wants to be an astronaut. When he makes his first flight in 1991, she'll be close at hand. I might be working in the Mission Control Center then, since I work on the shuttle also. But it'll be a very exciting time. And of the dangers? They just come with a job. It's following in the footsteps of you know, Columbus, and great explorers, and all the rest. But it's something we must do. You can't imagine the world in a thousand years without people going to the stars.